I believe one of the greatest hindrances of people coming to Christ is a misunderstanding of believing in God and having faith in God. They think they're synonymous when they're not. I believe in God for the same reason I believe in gravity. I can't see, hear, touch, taste or smell gravity, but I believe in it because I can see its effects. And I can't see, hear, touch, taste or smell God, but I believe in His existence intellectually because I can see the effects of God. All of creation screams that there's a creator. You can see the genius of God's creative hand through creation. The Bible says the heavens declare the glory of God and the earth shows his handiwork. But to have faith in God means to trust in his integrity, to believe and trust in his exceeding great and precious promises that are in the Bible. There are plenty of things in which we trust. We trust pilots, we trust taxi drivers, we trust dentists with our teeth, surgeons to operate on us. Listen to this very famous Bible verse, Hebrews 11, chapter 6. But without faith, it's impossible to please him. For he who comes to God must believe that he is. That's the intellectual belief in the existence of God. Only a fool would deny the existence of God, and that's what the Bible says. But listen to the second part of that verse. And that is the rewarder of those who diligently seek him. To please him, we must believe that he is and trust that he is the rewarder of those who diligently seek him. So there is the believe intellectually and trust in his integrity. Faith is the oxygen by which we live as Christians. Let me share something very personal with you. Many years ago, when those nasal strips became very popular, that sit across the top of the nose, that opened the airways about 40%. So a lot of celebrity sporting stars wore them when they were playing and they became very popular. So myself and many of my friends would use them because they'd help them sleep well at night. But I found something was low cost and you could use it again and again. It was a small plastic device that did exactly the same thing. But sometime last year, something very strange began to happen. For about two weeks, I struggled at night to breathe. What I'd done two weeks earlier is waved it over the soap before I washed it. I'd never done that before. It had hardened and blocked that little nasal thing. My pain was self-inflicted. And there is something that will deprive you of your oxygen as a Christian. It is self-inflicted, it's very subtle, and it can be fatal. It's something that I call analytic perfectionism, and you may have it. Let me read to you from Proverbs 3 verse 5. Trust in the Lord with all your heart, there's what to do. And then it says that warning, and lean not to your own understanding. It's saying, don't try and figure things out. Just trust the Lord like a little child trusts their father. Don't even question it. Now that's the antithesis of what the world thinks. Years ago, I was invited to Washington DC by a group of atheists. They wanted to interview me for an hour to find out what made me tick. It was kind of like a psychologist's couch. At the beginning of the interview, they grabbed this verse and put it up as a warning to other atheists. They didn't see that as a positive. They saw it as a very negative thing, not to lean to your own understanding. They were saying, this is a very dangerous thing to do. I had a very dear friend who suffered from the disease of analytic perfectionism. He would analyze everything. If I had have said to him, how do you know your mother is really your mother? He would have gone on a two month study of the thing. I mean, how do you know your mother is your mother? She could have picked you up at a hospital. How do you really know? And it really comes down to you do believe what they've told you. I raised you as my son. You were born at such and such a hospital. This is your mother, this is your father. It comes back to simple childlike trust. Even a DNA test comes back to my faith in its results. Do I trust it? So if your conversion to Christ was merely intellectual, all it will take is an intellectual atheist or a skeptic to talk you out of it. But if you came to Christ because you trusted the promises of God and the power of God transformed you and made you a new creature in Christ so that you love that which you once hated and hate that which you now love, then no one will shake your faith. Listen to 1 Peter. Jesus Christ, whom having not seen you love, though now you do not see him, yet believing, you rejoice with joy inexpressible and full of glory, receiving the end of your faith, the salvation of your souls. Hear what scripture says? Yet, believing you rejoice. If you've got no faith in the promise of God, you'll have no joy. Remember, 
trust is the oxygen by which the Christian lives. Listen to Scripture's warning. This is from the Amplified Bible. Take care, brothers and sisters, that there not be in any one of you a wicked, unbelieving heart which refuses to trust and rely on the Lord, a heart that turns away from the living God. Unbelief, a lack of trust, is a quietly subtle sin. It kept Israel going round and round the wilderness. For 40 years, they wouldn't trust the Lord. Zechariah was struck dumb because he wouldn't trust the Lord. And remember what Jesus said to those two disciples on the road to Emmaus. He said, O oh, fools and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. We are fools not to believe what the scriptures say. May I pluck out my right eye before I deem God as being untrustworthy. Just the thought of not trusting it makes me feel physically sick. In the same way, if I said to my wife, Honey, I don't trust you, what an insult that would be to her integrity. Think of the fruit of unbelief. David sinned horribly, took another man's wife, and then had him killed because of unbelief. He didn't believe that God would hold him accountable. Same with Judas. Same with Adam. They didn't believe they'd be held accountable. If the enemy can't get you from without, he'll get you from within. He will send a Trojan horse of doubting demons who whisper, has God said. Seeds of doubt will in time become cursed weeds that choke our faith. Unbelief is a tiny hole in a balloon that deflates our trust in God. May you and I dash any thoughts of unbelief, a lack of faith in the promises of God as quickly as we would dash an adulterous thought. Adultery is a blatant sin. Unbelief is a subtle soap in the nasal dilator. It's not so evident, but the consequences of its presence are frightening. Now watch this. <laughs> all right. Let's okay, Rudy, can I permission to interview for YouTube and for all media purposes? Sure, yes, you do. Tell me your thoughts on the afterlife. Well, you know, I'm not too sure. It's, it's kind of a tough question, but at the same time, I believe that when we, when it's our time to pass, I believe we go to heaven and we are finally, finally free and at peace, if that makes sense. Do you have a bucket list? Um, yeah, I do. What is it? Well, I, I mean, there's a, there's a few things I want to do. Mostly travel, you know. Nowadays? Yeah. With all the stress? Yes. I do <laughs> so not. Do you think it's I worth not, it? Yeah, I, I think so. Yeah. If I do it safe and, yeah. you know. Yeah. Yeah, I think, I think there's a lot in the world you need to see before you, before you go. Such as? Places, you know, countries, people. Um, Europe's a great place to visit. Yeah, I want to go there too. I want to go all over. We visited 13 countries in 13 days once and filmed. Wow, it was kind of pretty, stress. Yeah, I bet. Did you get any sleep? No, <laughs> <laughs> I didn't yeah. think so. <laughs> um, so what? What's your, what's your after bucket list? What's going to happen to you after you die? I don't know. Well, shouldn't I you really find out? I don't know. Would you ever leave on a plane not knowing where you're going? Wouldn't you make sure that you know your destination? Um, yes, I would like to know before, but also I would kind of just go with the flow. So if you, you know, if you got me a plane ticket to somewhere that I didn't know where I was going, I would probably take it just because I think it would be a good, a uh, good, uh, experience. Some Middle Eastern countries I wouldn't like to visit. <laughs> yeah, well, that's true, but hey, you know. So you're an educated person? I believe so. What's the world's biggest selling book of all time? The Bible, probably. Yeah. Are you familiar with the story of the rich young ruler? No. Yeah, it's very famous. He ran to Jesus, knelt down, and said, Good master, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? What do you think Jesus said to him? I mean, that's the big question. What shall I do to inherit eternal life? What do you think Jesus said? Uh, you know, just just follow, follow the Lord, follow the fellowship. I don't know. Go with the flow. Yeah, go with the <laughs> flow. That's my main motto, I guess, in life. Yeah. yeah. And he said something very unusual. He what said, why do you call me good? Because he's a good master. What shall I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said, there's none good but God. And it's strange because we all think we're good people. Do you think you're a good person? I believe so. Okay. Yeah. You know what Jesus gave him to show him he wasn't a good person? No. Ten commandments. Right. He said, you know the commandments and he named five of them. And the Bible says the rich man went away sorrowful because he didn't want to let go of his sins. He didn't want everlasting life. He preferred what he had to the gift of everlasting life. 
So Rudy, I'm going to do to you what Jesus did to the rich young ruler. Can you right. handle that? Sure. Okay. You think you're a good person. How many lies have you told? That's the ninth commandment. Uh, probably a lot. Okay. Now, yeah. what do you call someone who tells lies? Uh, a liar. <laughs> so, so what are you? I'm a liar. Now, do you still think you're a good person? Uh, yes, I do. Have you ever stolen something in your whole life? Yes, even? I have. Okay, it was quick. What do you call someone who steals? A thief. So what are you? A thief. No, you're not. You're a lying thief. <laughs> do you still think you're a good person? Yes. Okay. Have you ever used God's name in vain? I believe so, probably. Love your mother? Yes. Would you ever use her name as a cuss word? No. Why not? Because I love her. Yeah, if you slam your thumb with a hammer, right. you want to say a filth word beginning with S. You wouldn't right. equate your mother's name with that. No. That would be a horrible thing to do. Absolutely. And you, you've done it with the name of the God that gave you your mother and gave that's, you life. That's true, yeah. That's called blasphemy. So serious in the Old Testament, it was punishable by death. Mm -hmm. Do you still think you're a good person? <laughs> yes. Okay. <laughs> Jesus said, if you look at a woman and lust for her, you commit adultery with her in your heart. That's the seventh commandment. Have you ever looked at a woman with lust? Yes. Have you had sex before marriage? Yes. Have you ever hated somebody? No. Okay. So, Rudy, this is for you to judge yourself. I don't know you, right. so I can't judge you, but you've right. told me you're a lying, thieving, yes. blasphemous, fornicating, adulterer at heart who's self-righteous. That is, you say you're a good person when it's obvious you're not. Right. You're like the rest of us. So here's the big question. The big question. This is where we're going with this. If God judges you by the Ten Commandments on Judgment Day, we've looked at four of them, yeah. you're going to be innocent or guilty? Probably guilty. You can drop the probably. You'll be guilty. Yeah, guilty yeah, as sin. Most likely. <laughs> Would you therefore go to heaven or hell? Uh, I, just, I, I don't know. It's not my decision. I don't know where I'm going. <laughs> well, the Bible says all liars will have their part in the lake of fire. Mm -hmm. It says no thief, right. no adulterer, no fornicator, no blasphemer yeah. will inherit God's kingdom. So now you know your destination. Right, that's, so now that's you've got true. a choice. You can walk away like that rich man and be sorrowful. Mm -hmm. And keep your sins or you yeah. can say boy I better get this thing down I better find out my destination I don't want to end up in hell I've got to change that true yeah what did God do for guilty sinners so he wouldn't have to go to hell he forgave them no <laughs> I don't know yes you do but you've forgotten you don't understand the implications Jesus died on the cross for the sin of the world now you know that yes but most people don't know this the Ten Commandments are called the moral law you and I broke the law, yeah. Jesus paid the fine. Right. That's what happened on the cross. Yeah. Rudy, if you're in court and someone pays you fine, a judge can legally let you go. If you've got speeding tickets, and he says, oh, there's a stack of speeding tickets, it's pretty serious, but someone's paid them, right. you can go. Right. And you can do that which is legal and right and just. Even though you're guilty, you walk because someone paid you fine. And even though you and I are guilty before God of heinous crimes in the sight of a holy God, he's given us the death sentence. That's how serious sinners in God's eyes, the soul that sins, it shall die. That's what the Bible says. Even though we're guilty, even though we're rebels, God yeah. says he can forgive us in yeah. an instant and let us live forever, take the death sentence off us and let us walk out of his courtroom on judgment day all because the fine was paid by Jesus on that cross. Right. Familiar with John 3.16? Um, yes, I've heard of it, but I'm not too familiar. For God so loved the world, that's you, mm -hmm. that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes on him should not perish, right. but have everlasting life. Do you know the difference between believing in God and having faith in God? No. There's a huge difference. In fact, your eternity depends on your understanding of it. Believing in God is an intellectual acknowledgement of his existence. We look at creation and see the genius of his creative hand. The okay. Bible says the heavens declare the glory of God. So we know God exists intellectually. That's believing in God, but having faith in God is trusting in his promises, especially the promise of everlasting life. Right. Because the Bible says without faith it's impossible to please him. See, I couldn't please you if I didn't have faith in you. If I, I, you say, oh, my name's Rudy. I said, I don't believe that. Right. Where are you from? Don't believe that. I don't trust you, buddy. Yeah. We're not, we're not going to become friends because mm -hmm. friendship is held together by trust. Right. And you've got to approach God the same way. Right. He that comes to God must first believe that he is or he exists and that he's the reward of those that diligently seek him. So 
God's provided a way for you to be forgiven and find everlasting life as a free gift all because of the death and resurrection of the Savior. All you have to do to find everlasting life is repent of your sins. Right. Do what that rich young ruler didn't want to do. Say, I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a wretch, I'm a sinner. I've done things I know are wrong. I've been pornography and fornicating. Mm -hmm. My conscience condemned me. I know I've done wrong and I wouldn't even acknowledge it. Right. Use God's name as a cuss word when he gave me life. Mm -hmm. And come before God and say, I'm so sorry, and then put your trust in Jesus and what he did on the cross. And you have a promise from the God who cannot lie, he's without sin. Right. It's impossible for God to lie, that he'll grant you everlasting life in an instant, not because you're good, but because God is good and rich in mercy. Is this making sense? Yes. You're going to think about what we talked about? Yes. When are you going to get right with the Lord? Right now. Really? Can I pray <laughs> with you? Of course. Father, I pray for Rudy. Thank you for his openness and his honesty of heart. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Can I give you a book that I've written? Yes. Okay, let me grab it. I've already given it. Yeah. It's called How to Be Free from the Fear of How to Be Free from the Fear of Death. Oh, this is nice. Yeah, it's written in a New Zealand accent. Oh, okay, cool. It's like a joke. Yeah. <laughs> this is cool. Thank you. Okay, nice to meet you, Rudy. You too, thank you. Thank you. The Evidence Study Bible will give you everything you've ever wanted to know about subjects such as the theory of evolution, as well as valuable information about the cults and different religions, atheism, and biblical archaeology. It also contains hundreds of quality quotes, fascinating articles, amazing scientific facts in the Bible, and so much more. It even includes answers to 200 of the most commonly asked questions of the Christian faith. The Evidence Study Bible will thoroughly enrich your trust in God and in His precious Word. Get yours at livingwaters.com.